Hey, everybody, welcome to the Tex Mex podcast. We're your host, Eric Amando. This is episode 37. We do the research so you don't have to. Dale. 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 What we got, man? Ah, we got lots in Bitcoin uh, to cover today. I think last week we talked a little bit about maybe covering some of the models and frameworks that people are using to create their Bitcoin pr predictions. And I thought it might be kind of fun to also just go over some for some of the more fun looking predictions from some of the, the famous folks that are currently in the Bitcoin space. You want to get into yeah. it? I, I actually saw your note and you put it here, some sexy models. Uh, now you got me excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, okay. So uh, if we're going to talk about the whole episode today in crypto, we've got some sexy models to talk about and billion dollar Bitcoin predictions. In AI, we'll talk about AI washing and faking it till you make it, except sometimes you don't. And tech will cover the robo takeover and what to expect. In wealth, we cover the big generational shift occurring with the billionaires. All right. Let's, How about let's, that? Let's, oh, let's start, man. Let's dive into it. <laughs> There's lots to cover today. Sure. For the, uh, for the models, um, I really like this one, the, the rainbow chart. It's a... Um, it's a very, in my, in my mind, it's kind of like a very visual way. And I really like how they describe it. Um, you guys can Google it. And this uh, chart has been a while, right? I remember I'd seen this like maybe, what, eight, ten years ago. Um, yeah, it's been around for a while. It, I think they, they started it probably after the first couple of cycles. You know, they had enough data to kind of start putting that together, right? Yeah, yeah, because it, it, was, it was one of the first ones that I saw. The interesting thing is that literally when you see the chart of the uh, Bitcoin rainbow chart on the website, you see these colors of the rainbow. And then basically kind of like it starts from, from blue usually. And it says uh, basically basically a fire sale. So it's like when it's hitting that area, it's like, come on, man, just, just buy it. <laughs> it's yeah, cheap. Exactly. <laughs> right? And then it starts moving to the next one. It's like, uh, you know, it's... Just buy, right? It's like it's it's a it's a bias market, like similar to mm -hmm. the real estate market. Then you move you move into kind of more of the all right, people is accumulating, right, with green. So they start just accumulating Bitcoin. Then you start moving kind of in the center, it's like still cheap. <laughs> 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 then it's like okay, it start getting pricey, right? So it's basically then hold <laughs> hold all, hold all it, right? Because now um kind of the price is, is getting higher and higher. Then it's like, hmm, orange. Is this is a bubble? <laughs> 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 then it's like suddenly you see like all of the DJs FOMO, like in, uh. <laughs> intensify and it's like everyone just getting into it. And then it just start getting into the red zone, right? Like sell, 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 man. It's like, this is yeah. like a bubble for sure. It's like a maximum bubble territory. And you know what is the funny part though? What's that? Sometimes we actually have even go outside of the model to even different color outside of the, this is the maximum <laughs> bubble territory. <laughs> you fall out of the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. So this model in particular, um, uh, kind of it broke uh, a couple of years ago um, in, in both ways. So, so they had readjusted it. Um, so, but I still, I still really like this one because it actually has the, um, the halvings kind of very um, kind of the lines, the vertical lines for the halvings. So it, it, again, it helps you to visualize it very, very good. What's your take there? Hey, I, I think it's a really easy way to tell you kind of like when you should be accumulating or buying and when you should probably be DCAing out, right? Dollar cost averaging mm -hmm. out. So, I mean, I think it's a very, very clear, clear line. Now, uh, the plot that this has, I think it maybe shows a little bit of diminishing returns on Bitcoin. So it's not growing as much as, um, as much, um, every cycle, in, right? in the beginning, yeah, in the yeah, beginning of as the it did in the beginning. Right. So again, it's a, it's a log growth curve. And so, um, you can imagine it is going to go kind of like this and it's going to even out towards the end cycles. Right. So you may not see as much growth towards the end. So I think that's, uh, an important thing to point out for the rainbow chart. However, some people are saying that that diminishing returns, it, that may not be something that is actually 
um, that may not hold true in the coming cycles just because we're seeing a lot of other things. And we'll explore some of the other laws um, in, yeah. in a couple of other sections, but uh, that's important to know. But it's a very useful tool. The colors are very easy to understand when you look at it. We're going to share all the links in our notes. So when you're looking through these, you can go to the websites and, and look these up and, and play with them a little bit. But rainbow chart, very easy to use. Right now, what color are we in, Mondo? Does, uh, do you have it up? Um, I think we, we're in a, a HODL. HODL we're in a HODL, in a, in a HODL accumulation. Between HODL and accumulation, yeah, we're kind mm -hmm. of in the middle. So, uh, which is it's not bad, right? We still... You can still accommodate, and and you still, people think that the that the price is pretty high. And I've seen some YouTuber very publicly. Uh, there was this guy. Uh, do you know who is um, uh, Card Cardon, right? Like, oh yeah, um, Grant Grant Cardon. Grant Cardon. Mm -hmm. Well, he has like a twin. He looks almost like him. Really, Gary, <laughs> Gary oh, Cardon. So I, because I, I I stumbled upon him, it's like. Uh, on on YouTube, it's like what the heck? What happened with him? Is he, he seems a little bit like skinnier, and his <laughs> voice is a little bit more like a different. So like, huh? Is he getting like weird or older <laughs> or like sick or like I don't know, right? Yeah. Kind of different. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, he's Gary Cardone, and then <laughs> I figured out that was his um, brother. Well, the guy is into crypto. He mm. sold his mansion, uh, two point eight millions. Nice. And the guy's like, I'm putting every single penny at $68,000 per Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, this is a guy that said he sold his, is this the one that sold his house? And people uh, are like, well, what are you going to do with the money? He's like, I'm going all in on Bitcoin. Yep. Yep. <laughs> the, the guy is, is, is out there and, and he already has his following. Um, uh, I mean, he has the last name, right? So Cardone. Mm -hmm. So people might be thinking that is the Grand Cardone, but, but yeah, that, that guy is doing it. So. And again, uh, multiple people are being very public to, they don't care the price right now. They don't want a DCA. Uh, they're like, nope, I don't care. Because for them, it's like, um, they are going to wait for a, uh, the guy is saying, I'm going to wait for the two, three years. And hopefully even I just double my money. And he started just giving examples on the real estate with that particular mansion mm -hmm. that he actually was almost losing money in several yeah. years um, that he hold it. Yeah, there's lots of carrying costs involved uh, with owning a mansion. You know, you can imagine the upkeep that it needs, the repairs that it needs, um, the taxes he has to pay if he had, you know, a loan, all the interest that was going into it. So there's a lot of carrying costs for something like that. So, um, yeah, and then he said he maybe lost a little bit or maybe it was close to breaking even when he actually sold the mansion. Yeah. Um, and he says in Bitcoin, you know, he's, he's going to destroy that, <laughs> that return. So yes. very interesting there. All right. The next one, next one that we got is what stock to flow. This is a pretty popular one. The stock to flow model. Um, just to explain a little bit kind of what stock to flow means. Um, so the stock to flow is a number that shows how many years at the current production rate are required to achieve the current stock. So the higher the number, the higher the expected price. And it, this speaks a little bit to scarcity. So currently, the stock to flow is about 56 for Bitcoin. And that equates, and there's a formula basically, that equates to a $120,000 fair value price. Um, after the halving that's coming up here in about a few weeks, uh, 420, the stock to flow number for Bitcoin will be 113. Uh, so that's over doubling, right? Basically, it's doubling because of the halving, right? That means the the flow or how much we're making um, is being cut in half. Uh, and for reference, gold is a 62 in this stock to flow. So currently, gold is above Bitcoin. But after the halving, Bitcoin is going to be roughly double uh, of gold. Um, so that usually indicates that there's going to be a shot up in price. And so stock to flow, again, has been one of these early ones that has been around for a while. And you'll see it. And again, we'll include the links. This is the step looking model where it goes like this after every halving and it's stepping its way up. Um, it's like a, almost like a staircase, right? Like in, mm -hmm. a, in a parabolic way. Um, uh, it, that one is an interesting one, uh, and it keeps that one is not um, bounded like the the rainbow one. Again, remember these are models, I and mean, every model is just a glimpse of trying to 
to see uh, the perspective, right? That doesn't mean that it's going to be true. <laughs> yeah. It's just literally some ideas to be able to guide you through. Um, look at them sometimes like maps, maybe. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll go into those territories, but that doesn't mean that. Even our GPS are not even that exact, right? <laughs> Recalculating. <laughs> so, so you might see that you are going in that direction. Oops, recalculating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just like we mentioned on the rainbow chart, the stock to flow, it has averages, basically. Uh, it does have averages for these prices. And sometimes it goes above the average and sometimes it's kind of below the average. But in general, the stock to flow model has held uh, very loosely. So it's continuing to climb up. And that's where a lot of people right now are saying, okay, uh, Sakcha Flow says fair value is about 120K right now. So we're slightly below that. So we're, there's a value to be had there if you buy now. Again, <laughs> we're not financial advisors here. We're just kind of explaining these models to you. Um, after the, the halving, typically you see the price follow up uh, for stock to flow. So stock to flow shows an average of around 500 K I think for this cycle. Again, that means, and it typically overshoots it, the price. So they're saying it'll likely overshoot it. So it may, that's why you're hearing some people saying a million dollars, 800 K as the top this cycle. But what happens afterwards, it usually comes down and it'll, it'll dip below the 500 to average out that 800. Right. Because it's always trying to kind of model the stock to flow, this average. So there will be price action above the average and below the average to get you to that average. So uh, yeah. pretty interesting. This one gets people really excited because if you go to the following cycles, you see that the, the number just kind of continues to climb. Yeah, which I think that um, this one it, it, uh, kind of also uh, helps to visualize after the halvings, um, the, the, the previous one, the rainbow chart, I feel that is more, it was an interesting one to see kind of on, on the halvings. But once that we finish the last one, uh, as you mentioned, in a couple of weeks, then another model has to. So I think that this is a, a good model to, to continue to watch after the halvings. All right. Um, the next one, the power law is one that we've started to hear a little bit more about. So uh, this, there's a physicist out there, and he explains how this, the power law model uh, points to a $10 million Bitcoin by 2045. So that's basically in what 20, in about 20 years, he says Bitcoin would be at about $10 million. So this physicist, his name is Giovanni uh, Santostasi. Um, he's a physics professor. Uh, he forecasts that the market cap could surpass that of gold by 2033 as well. So this power law is something that um, it's basically just a mathematical relationship. And it's one of those things kind of like Fibonacci, like you see it in lots of places in natural phenomenon. The power Ooh. law is also seen <laughs> Fibonacci is also seen kind of in this in a natural phenomenon type of way as well. So it's kind of one of these natural predictable patterns and Bitcoin seems to be following this uh, price movement over time uh, following this power law. So what do you think about a 10 million prediction, Mondo? I mean, dude, I have even seen like this week 1 billion. Even for me, Maxi, right? It's like, uh, okay, man. It's like, They're like uh, how is that going to happen? <laughs> so, so I think that um, it is interesting to all of these people because we, we saw it growing uh, a thousand times, right? So so uh, it would not surprise me to, if we jump to literally to right now, uh, we were in almost 15K in a couple of years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Then, then we jump into a hundred k very in, in the next few few months, and then in, during the next couple couple months, we we jump into a million. It would not be crazy to jump ten times, right, from there. Mm -hmm. So right now, it might seem like um, unrealistic, but I think that is it's very hard to to predict these things. So, so I, I think that is more about um, uh, trying to. If you don't need the money, right? Like uh, keep investing it in and and just put it aside because these numbers might be uh, substantial, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ten millions, I still think that is reachable. A billion, man, I start to to doubt, right? Uh, <laughs> that one, we will have to be 
maybe in 30, 40 years that inflation has caught up on us and things like that. That's right. There, there should be an assist there. I think one, one important thing to note, I think a lot of times when we're thinking about Bitcoin price, we're thinking linearly, like, mm. you know, like, you know, it's just going up kind of in a straight line, but kind of like what this power law is talking about and what some of these other stocks to flow rainbow charts, they, they're not, it's not a, lin, these are not linear charts. They, these are logarithmic charts. So there's an exponential type function to this. So it's, it's not just going at a diagonal like that. It's actually going in the sweeping motion up. That's what it seems to be following. So it's important to know when you're talking about log, the number goes up a lot, a lot faster um, mm. as you get towards the edges, right? Um, versus a linear fashion. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so power law, again, this uh, uh, physicist is talking about 10 million Bitcoin in, in 20 years. Um, the next one is a little bit more practical. So this is uh, uh, the thought about demonetizing global assets, Okay. So in this one, this is uh, this concept is being explained by Jesse Myers here, and we'll again link this up so you guys can do a deep dive in it. There's a lot of good information in this one, but it really the article really discusses Bitcoin's potential value for appreciation, driven by its increasing scarcity and design as a store of value asset. So it's competing against other traditional assets like gold, bonds, and real estate that are also typically thought of as store of value assets so whenever you have money that you you you're investing it because you don't want it to lose its value to inflation um you're buying things like gold um real estate also a lot of people buy real estate it's like when people buy new york real estate out there they're buying that real estate but they're not living in in those houses right they're just parking money out there so it doesn't lose value and we're talking about like the big billionaire row houses out there right? where uh, there's a lot of vacancies over there, but people do it because they're buying it. Same thing with like artwork and things like that. They're buying expensive artwork so they can park their money there, hold the value over time. They're saying Bitcoin is a basically a superior version of this. <coughs> that, that's what Michael Saylor it continues to, to preach, right? Like uh, um, that basically... It's better than any of those, right? Because uh, you, it is not liquid. If you, if you want, if let's say that you get a Picasso or a Monet uh, piece of art, and it's like, okay, you have to do maybe in, in Christie's. Christie's is the like, uh, the company that usually auctions this type of uh, art. Mm -hmm. uh, then you're gonna have to wait, obviously, less the commissions and all of that. So it, it takes time to unload. Your Picasso, right? Yeah, <laughs> or your Monet, or whatever it is the. Uh, talking about that, which one would you choose, uh, Eric? <laughs> uh, there's, I, you know what, I do like a lot of them, but I do like to support some of the more Latino um, artists. So I think I would. Oh, be so then you like those. Botero? Unfortunately, Botero, Frida is yeah. not there any, anymore. Either. <laughs> Maybe a, a real Frida Kahlo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And by the way, when we were in Mexico City, we went to visit Frida Kahlo's place, right? There was a long line, so we didn't get to go inside. Long, yeah, but there was a I got my selfie line. there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think that um, for um, putting cash and parking it, there are different, uh, different things. And yeah, Bitcoin is way superior um, to, to any of those. Right. So... When you're and when you're looking at these global assets right now, the right now the total is like nine hundred trillion dollars. This is that this is the the market size, um, total addressable market that really Bitcoin has, right, to demonetize. And when we say demonetize, um, we're saying uh people will opt to um people will opt to buy Bitcoin or invest in Bitcoin over art or over real estate because there's benefits, right? Like with real estate, there's overhead. You got to do the maintenance, the upkeep, all the things that we're talking about with uh, Gary Cardone, right? There's things like that. So Bitcoin is a superior asset. So there's this flight to safety or flight to value where people will opt to buy Bitcoin instead of those other areas. So if you try to calculate it, and that's what this, this framework or model is showing, even if even if uh, you see a shift from artwork, from real estate, from stocks and bonds and things like that, at like a 
shift over into Bitcoin, you're talking about a $900 trillion market. You're going to get, you know, 90 trillion if you're talking about like 10%. So what does that equate? $90 trillion for a Bitcoin price. And that's how they're coming up with this $10 million uh, Bitcoin prediction. It's because it's even at very small percentages, that price of Bitcoin would go up if you're for those people that are saying, you know what, it's just easier to buy Bitcoin and hold it versus having to buy and sell this artwork or having to take care of these collectibles or buying the real estate and things like that. Yeah, I, I think that also we we have been mentioning about the ETFs and Wall Street coming in, right? So and they're now here. And now you have big players, right? You have Fidelity, we have BlackRock, we have we have covered it through these weeks and months, um, all of these events. Uh, something that we have not mentioned here is that each of these um, hedge funds managers, they get paid if they are moving your money around. They don't get paid if you have just cash, right? Like, uh, because guess what? Uh, for right now, the, the interest rates, uh, you can find a high yield account for 5%. So, which remember, in real estate, usually average is about uh, 5 6%. Yeah, you can get way better returns and all of that. But uh, uh, in, in traditionally, for the last 25 years or so, it has been kind of that. So then why would you just keep your money in real estate when you can literally just put it on your uh, bank, in your favorite bank, whatever it is that is giving you high yield, then your, your, your interest rate, right? So what happens with hedge funds is that they, if they don't move the money around and they, in, they invest it in different assets, they're not, they're not, they're not going to get paid because they will have to return the money to their customers and their customers are just going to put it in their uh, savings account with high yield <laughs> interest mm -hmm. rates. So what these uh, hedge fund managers need to do is to allocate it in different places. And in some instances, like uh, um, when they want to, to not be in the market, they have to find instruments or assets which is like, it used to be gold, it used to be metals, right? Commodity, basically they call them commodities. Mm -hmm. And now crypto is becoming kind of another uh, area where, okay, maybe Bitcoin is start getting uh, interesting and in, uh, not tied to any of the other assets. Then, as you said, if it becomes a percentage, two, 3%, 5% of that market is, is huge. Yeah, exactly. So that's why this one to me, it makes a lot of sense, right? It's not just like math and looking at charts <laughs> going up, right? It's actually like thinking through logically, okay, this is what's in the market today, $900 trillion. Bitcoin has a good chance of taking, you know, 5 to 10% of this market. You know, you just do the math and then it comes up to 10 million. So I think that that one makes a lot of sense. And I encourage you guys to click on that link specifically because it does break it down and it shows you a chart and table of kind of what all these different assets are today um, and how much Bitcoin has like likelihood to to take um, in the near future. All right. So I know we're done with the sexy models. Where, let's move on to some of these um, um, strong predictions here with uh, Samson Mao. So Samson Mao is kind of a Bitcoin maxi, <laughs> uh, not too unlike us. And uh, he's a CEO of Jan3. So he runs basically a Bitcoin type business. Um, and he's saying that <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin will likely hit a million dollars um, very, very soon or like within this cycle. Um, what do you think about that? I think that if you see the models, it's, it's possible. Um, if we, if, like in a few weeks, we hit 100K, it's like, uh, and we have seen it, right? We have seen that this could, could go. Um, I, I probably, I would be very curious where it will come from, right? Like, um, is it going to come from more political? Because maybe another country, a bigger country is going to start just using it. Um, yeah, because be, let's be honest, would you put your money like in rubles, right? I mean, I have a lot of <laughs> Russian friends, so don't, don't, no offense there. But, <laughs> but, uh, it's true, but it's like, it's a, true. like and, and the same rupees well or even like Mexican that. peso, right? Yeah. And Mexican <laughs> so, peso is doing pretty good lately, so this is for sure. Is that we'll, we'll discuss the the upcoming Mexico <laughs> Mexican economy, right? But. Uh, right. Uh, the, the reality is that the, my the answer is no. I uh, no even dollars, though, right? It's like um, yeah, we we mention it, and it's not all even us. You have like like rate value. He said like several months back, 
that trash is uh, that the cash is trash, which is kind of weird, right? Like, uh, then you see say, uh, Michael Saylor basically saying, "Hey, um, uh, <laughs> people that hold fiat, yeah, uh, <laughs> we call them the poor. <laughs> we call them poor. Yeah, it's yes. like these are like interesting quotes here, right?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so so I think that uh, you we have to come up with one, uh, I guess, ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll coin one here soon. But yes, um, uh, one thing that some Mao does point out, and this is something that we've said, right, for the for the uh, OG DGENs out there that, that you alluded to earlier, Mondo, is that there's this thing called the Veblen effect. And what the Veblen effect says is like... Um, wait, 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 a what? <laughs> Veblen. It's not... I, I'm like a Veblen. What the heck is that, right? Yes. Uh, it's like a, a goblin? No, <laughs> kind of like a goblin, right? <laughs> right? No, but a Veblen, the Veblen effect basically says that um, as Bitcoin's value increases, it becomes more desirable, okay? So as it goes up, more people want to buy. So that's potentially leading to surpassing the gold market cap and becoming the new standard for storing value. Um, and that's how it would demonetize gold. Okay. So the Veblen effect basically describes what all the, the OG DGENs are doing, or basically once we get to the top, everyone kind of FOMOs in. That's what he says is going to probably attribute to that $1 million. Of course, we know how Bitcoin cycles happen and work. They go up reach a top and then come back down um, a little bit afterwards. So um, while yes, it may reach that $1 million uh, point, um, it usually comes back down. Mm -hmm. Of course, with all of the demand and the having and things like that, the question is, okay, how far back down is it going to come? And that's why we rely on some of the other models like the rainbow yeah. chart and, mm -hmm. and, and the others to tell us that. And basically in, U in US though, um, there is almost close to 24 million millionaires. So that can give you, just in US, right? And if they want a, a piece of Bitcoin, right? <laughs> so, and it's only, uh, in theory, it's supposed to be 21 million Bitcoins always. But right, right now, I, I really think that it's gonna be way less than with that because all of the Cis coins, all of the, the people that died and they didn't, um, Transfer able to, it or whatever. Yeah, transfer <laughs> or whatever, or even hacks or lost it by bad hardware or things like that. I, I think that we might be just closer to 19 millions, um, yeah. uh, like that we could have access to um, the whole ecosystem. And and globally, there are about uh, 55 million uh, millionaires. And again, it's not only the millionaires that, that buy crypto, right? But it just gives you an idea if you start kind of distributing how these prices can can go very very high exactly so um those are some of the price pressures that drive the price up over time um another interesting one here is fidelity <clears throat> another price prediction so um this is like the kind of the big one um so <coughs> Uh, Jurian Timmer of Fidelity, he predicts that one Bitcoin could be worth $1 billion by 2038. Uh, 2038 is just around the corner, right? It's under 15 years from now. Um, $1 billion Bitcoin. Um, and he even says um, we would get to $100 million first by 2035. So that's like in, in just 10 years. But if you think about it in terms of cycles, $1 billion dollar Bitcoin maybe in three cycles, a hundred million in two cycles. Um, so that's kind of how you start thinking about it in terms of these Bitcoin cycles where you see these blow off tops and things like that. So, but his predictions are based on basically a combination of stock to flow and this demand model that he's come up with and demand basically meaning we got institutional investors that want to buy, like Mondo was saying, we've got so many millionaires in the world that want to buy, um, there's a, a people that are uh, a flight to value, right? So people that are moving, instead of buying art or real estate, they're going to buy Bitcoin instead. There's that demand. So that's what he's using to get to this uh, $1 billion by 2038 again in 15 years. My best years. though is that maybe dollar loses its value. <laughs> You're right. 
That's part so of the it's, it's too, like, right? Maybe that billion is like, hmm, it will be like a one million in today's time, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. If there is hyper Bitcoinization, and if y'all haven't heard that term, it's like when everything in the world is like denominated in Bitcoin, like instead of dollars or whatever, becomes like the standard currency. Uh, instead of, uh, or not just hyper Bitcoinization, but you might see hyperinflation in some areas. And mm -hmm. I think maybe he's probably including some chance of something like that happening, right? Where the value of the dollar, um, continues to kind of, uh, drop because of inflation. So that would help out to get a $1 billion Bitcoin, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I start liking it more fidelity after they name it their, uh, ETF F B T C. I do like that too. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you say that? It's like fuck F B T or no fuck B T C or like yeah fuck B T C. Yeah, it's like F B T C <laughs> man. It's like <laughs> that's the name. <laughs> it's like it's catchy though. I like it. it it's catchy. I'll tell them now. Whoever was the marketing person over there like kudos to you you were able to push that thing <laughs> into these uh 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 you know like the suits you know like uh <laughs> imagine him going into the conference room is like this is my idea and he puts it up on the screen fbtc everyone's like ah. <laughs> I, I there are a couple things like that like uh sometimes i see the rockets right like uh, from the uh, amazon um uh, blue origin <laughs> rocket like mm -hmm. come on man that one looks like a penis <laughs> make it pointier <laughs> it's like how you cannot actually i mean i think that sometimes they do it on purpose you know? <laughs> i know right elon has said so himself already right he's like yeah make it pointier man <laughs> that's too funny but yeah it is catchy um i'm probably gonna um diversify into some uh, fidelity also so Got to give them props. I like I like what all the ETF ecosystem did, so I want to reward them a little bit yes. with with some of that. Um, yeah, share some love. If you have economy. some accounts like in four hundred one k, and you are like a, a Bitcoin maxis, <laughs> why not? <It's> like, <laughs> Sprinkle the love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I BTC, yeah, BTC, all right. <laughs> That was too funny. Well, of course, this is the last. Uh, we've got one more. Kathy Wood, she's one of the OGs as well. She's been um, promoting Bitcoin um, for for a long time now. And uh, she says that the Bitcoin price could go up to about $3.8 million, $3 million here pretty soon as well. Um, <clears throat> she's saying she, uh, and she just actually recently revised this. She was saying like a million and a half or something like that. But now that the ETFs have seen such... Uh, success recently. She recalibrated, redid her motto, and now they're saying $3.8 million due to like all the adoption that they've seen with this. Um, and she thinks this uh, by 2030. So within this cycle or next, it should get you 3.8 million. So okay. that's not, again, that's not too far off. We're talking about five, six years here um, that, that she's thinking 3.8 million is attainable. So it's, it's pretty much in line with a lot of the others that we're seeing. Yeah, so uh, it's getting it is it's getting pricey and pricey, right? So we were have been saying get at least point two Bitcoin, but now even that, right? It's like uh, for some people might might not be so. Um, do fifty dollars, right? Like do whatever you you can. Uh, some of this money might be substantially uh, differently. Uh, See, see them as uh, lottery tickets. <laughs> if maybe that fifty dollars becomes maybe a million in <laughs> in, in some point, right? So, uh, but yeah, uh, don't tell us that we didn't tell you. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? And just remember, like the Bitcoin having is coming up, and that's also going to be supply shock, right? If you're thinking about demand and supply. If there's less supply and more demand, that's going to have a upward pressure on price momentum, right? Volatility to the upside. <clears throat> um, so that's what we've seen in the past, at least. Hey, I just want to remind you, if you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. It really does help us out. We love to hear your comments. We like to incorporate some of what you guys say into, into the show. So uh, just a reminder, uh, uh, like, subscribe, and comment to help us grow. And Eric loves his haters. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know, you know, it's so funny. We get a lot of Craig Wright supporters out there. They're like, oh yeah, he's, like, he's the a heck? real Satoshi. I, you cannot dude, convince me. I just me think otherwise. that he's Craig himself. Like I'll give you. <laughs> it might be Craig. He might have a bot out there or something that looks his name up. Who knows? Uh, or a, or an army of people, right? So yeah. <laughs> yeah so all right. Uh, oh, I do want to point out, man, on the on the all time high meme video. Mm-hmm. By the way, uh, it's got over six thousand views now. You guys have been awesome in in supporting us with that video. But there's someone says, hey, buddies, like, I love it. I'm going to be in my villa here after the having in South America. We're loving it. It's going to be a party for the next year with Bitcoin prices going up. So we love to see that enthusiasm from y'all. We're also excited. We're also ready to party over this next year because we know what's coming. So, uh, And again, if you have a villa, invite us. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll do a remote location uh, podcast taping. <laughs> awesome. Well, okay. Uh, now that we've gone through our Bitcoin stuff, let's talk about AI, man. <laughs> man, it's like I, I, there are new new terms uh, coming in. Uh, have you heard this term AI washing? Well, I've heard of other kind of washing. What kind? Of, what's AI washing? <laughs> <laughs> so, what it is and what what is what is that, right? So, right now, um, regulators are cracking down on companies, specifically at agency companies. Um, and this mm. is this term is actually coming from um, uh, kind of the stock market from the SEC, mm-hmm. where uh, some advertisement uh, ad- agencies or even companies they are claiming that they're using AI. When they're not. <laughs> Sounds familiar. So, so imagine if you just do like a, like a maid service. And yeah, we're using AI. We're using AI for a maid service. Pick us. Or like, what does that even mean? It's like, well, there are a lot of companies like that, right? So the government yeah. is, I, I'm pretty glad that they're doing that, right? Because mm-hmm. it, it creates um, a, a whole gambit of different problems, right? Because yeah. uh, it's, it's hard confusion. to trust. It's confusion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So kudos for the government. Usually we give, we don't give them credit. But for this one, I think that this it's, it's a good one. And yes, uh, AI washing is kind of the uh, the term that is that is coming out. So um, what do you think about that? It's pretty interesting. And now I'll, I'll mention this one example, right, that we just recently heard this week, right? Um, <clears throat> Amazon. Right. So you remember the Amazon Go? I know you you definitely do, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I well, actually, because I live in Seattle, I, I mm-hmm. attended the first, when they opened it, the first one, right? So, uh, uh, but yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that their walkout technology, right? So that's, if you guys have seen the videos of basically this, uh, not the, I don't think they've had too many versions of this around, but where you can just walk in grab something off the shelf and then walk out. If you're a registered Amazon user, it'll just automatically charge you. So you don't have to do the whole register cash li- and, you know, pay and all of that. It's all just it was cashless, though. You didn't have to, to even pay. They have your uh, credit card as they well. Have your account, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I think they were telling that, Hey, this new AI visual technology, it's, it's doing all of it. You know, they were doing the AI washing, right? Basically what, what they were doing. Right. I have well, no idea. We find out recently. Yeah. So I and and again, this article is public. Um, I kind of knew this because I I was in that area, right? I and mean, I, mean, I mm-hmm. worked for Amazon for a little bit, and and now the report came out though uh, that they had a, literally a thousand Indian people, and I'm not trying to <laughs> to be racist here. The article said that, right? <laughs> and it's like. Man, I'm surprised how like these big companies don't get in trouble for lying, right? Like uh, because we see uh, like Theranos, right? Like the yeah. uh, the lady she said that she had a how is how the Theranos is not different from this one, right? Like uh, yeah, they, they are like a smoky mirrors, yeah, yeah, yeah. AI, <laughs> the AI is doing it. <laughs> AI does it. And like oh, enough said. Yeah, I totally believe it now. <laughs> so. <laughs> So yeah, so I think and 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 now uh, that article, right? They are saying, well, uh, we are not doing that anymore. Uh, we are actually planning to um, do uh, baskets to be yeah. to basically be able to to get it like a, your your shopping cart, right? Um, what do you think there? I, I have a couple ideas on why maybe 
uh, they're going in that direction. But uh, what's your take there? Well, I think like a lot of AI companies or a lot of companies are trying to downsize because they're like, they need AI to actually work and reduce costs. So maybe it'll be easier to track in a basket versus like having an AI watch you or an army of, of folks over in India uh, just watching you and manually doing it and manually charging you. I mean, I, that is just so disingenuous. Like people are thinking they're going in there shopping, like, oh, I'm part of this cool AI, whatever experiment. <laughs> and it's really someone in the background, like, ah, what, what is they this got two gonna... oranges, <laughs> a loaf of bread <laughs> and a Snickers bar. Okay. You know, uh, 9.95. There we go. Uh, it, it's just kind of funny. I don't know. It, it is, it is funny, but I still <laughs> a little bit like shitty, you know, that, this yeah. company is they they are doing it so uh, <laughs> uh it, it is it is tough i think that um uh when they open it um i mean and, and we see it also with elon right elon yeah yeah we have like a cars that they can drive themselves like man you were in mexico city right and you <laughs> i don't think that you have been ever in india right but uh Not in like india. you go to these places man it's like there's no way that yeah. <laughs> i can't even drive myself <laughs> there. <laughs> well you start small i guess so start with the u.s right uh maybe a little bit more predictable here <laughs> yeah yeah so so that was an interesting uh story about ai and i i'm, I'm very impressed on the on the things that they are coming in like every month right but yeah mm-hmm. this one is uh uh, a reminder that sometimes you, if you fake see a black you box, make it. <laughs> <laughs> fake it till you make it. <laughs> they took that literally, huh? Yes. Oh, uh, it's too funny. Well, okay. So like we did mention, right? Maybe they're moving to this basket system because maybe they don't downsize their, their army in India, but uh, you know, it's not a new phenomenon. So they're, um, they're saying uh, CNN's reporting that you know a lot of companies they're saying that technology is going to help shrink workforces within the next five years um, through a survey. So um, there's a global survey of C executives uh, that are indicating that 41 percent expect. So that's 41 of these businesses expect to employ fewer people due to the integration of artificial intelligence in the workplace. So I guess everyone's doing this AI washing or expecting AI to really impact their business. And especially over 40, over the next five years, I mean, they're saying, you know, half of these businesses are saying they're going to reduce, uh, reduce the workforce. Um, we are seeing every company, tech, big company trying to do their own robots. So that's the next wave, right? So um, if you think that maybe because you do, you work for a restaurant or become a, a waiter or whatever, right? Some of the, mm-hmm. the jobs that it, it requires to be there, think again, because uh, some of these companies, they are doing it in Amazon, right? For to be mm-hmm. able to pick some products. Um, and, and I think that uh, uh, you see Tesla, uh, Optimus, right? And you see uh, Boston Dynamics, uh, all of these different companies. Um, you start seeing even Apple, right? That was the other... Um, kind of news that came out of tech that uh, Apple is working on a robo butler. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there. <laughs> it's like, finally, I'm going to tell, uh, is, this is not going to be Alexa. Alexa, <laughs> do the dishes, right? This is going to be like, be uh, I guess, like Siri. <laughs> Siri, do, do the dishes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, so what we're seeing here is this, this overall trend. Companies are starting to realize, yes, we're going to be... <clears throat> Yes, we're we're going to be looking at possible workforce reduction. And when when this happens, they may be able to redeploy some of the employees back into the company, right? They get a different job. But for some of the others, they might just be let go and they're going to be looking specifically for people that have AI experience. So, I know we've mentioned it before when we were seeing a lot of the big tech layoffs going on. One of the things that people need to do is become more familiar with AI because that's going to give you a leg up. Um, AI is going to be kind of a big part of, you know, a lot of the jobs coming up. So you need to be able to to um, to do that. One other thing here is that, you know, uh, we're saying this this report says like it's over 40 percent of people. Right. Uh, before the World Economic Forum was saying only 25% of these companies were thinking about it. So that number has continued to increase. As we see more AI tech become available, as we're seeing the capabilities come out, more of these businesses, more of these CEOs are going to realize, 
oh man, these capabilities, AI can actually do stuff. It's not just like this Amazon, Amazon Go experiment. They might be, be able to replace actual people with a lot of these things. So I think that's important to see um, where, where it's headed. You know, that number is just going to continue to go up. Yeah, for sure. So there, there is more news on, um, on, on tech, right? And this one is a very interesting one. It's um, uh, Tesla is unveiling its new robot taxi. And this is like coming like in the next uh, few months in August 8. So <laughs> um, we start seeing where these companies are like trying to, to make more money, right? And, and one way for them is like, well, if, if they already have uh, built the cars, and if they uh, they can make it sell, drive themselves, then why not a robot taxi, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be interesting how Uber and Lyft and all of these uh, uh, companies like ride sharing um, uh, behave, or even their stocks, right? Like, a, um, I think that this is going to be a, an interesting uh, battle between these companies where they might have to even buy other one to try to compete to do them themselves the same thing. So what's yeah. your take there? Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's gonna be a lot of disruption in the market. So there was a there was a report earlier this week, right? Which I think was was maybe why Elon tweeted this out. So there was a report that Elon was canceling the twenty five thousand dollar car because they were, you know, we've been talking about Mexico has is building a Tesla factory. Reportedly they were gonna build the twenty five thousand dollar Tesla EV out there. Um, it was supposed to be like the cheapest EV, but recently there's been a lot of EVs coming out of China, like with BYD, where their prices are really, really low as well. And so there's some competition going on here. So maybe Elon is like <clears throat> thinking, uh, okay, maybe I don't want to compete in that space. What I'd rather compete in is the robo taxi, which he would still be building that cheap car, but it, he would be adding his other kind of advantage, which is the AI and the self-driving, combining those two strengths into make the robo taxi. And I don't know if he would operate them themselves, like by Tesla, or if he would license it, license those cars for like an Uber or a Lyft or something like that. Obviously, this is brand new. A lot of those details aren't out yet, but like you said, these companies need to come up with a strategy to figure out what to do next. Yeah, because it, it might, either way it would be very interesting, right? Like um, let's say that you have your Tesla and it's already parked in your garage. Suddenly you are in your home watching TV and you literally move your Tesla. Sure, just be a robot taxi. Then literally your car <laughs> gets out of your garage by itself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it just goes and works for you, right? Uh, the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> hustling <laughs> <laughs> hustle baby hustle <laughs> <laughs> every day i'm hustling <laughs> so so and, and the car just goes and hustle for you make some couple hundred bucks a day right and a night in this case and then in the morning you use it right uh, yeah. when you when you want to uh, that's ultim the ultimate dream that could be one approach right or the other approach is that elon is like screw that as might as well just have his fleet force of uh, army of robot taxis yep. and do it himself, right? So um, either way, it's in, it's in, they're interesting models, either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do it lots of different ways. I think in the past, Elon has mentioned that, hey, if you buy, if you buy full self-driving package, which is right now like $12,000 $12, for your Tesla, if you buy it in the future, once it's activated, uh, full autonomy, you can make $100,000 a year with your vehicle. That's what he's been saying. And that's the carrot he's been dangling in front of people to get them to try and buy the $12,000. I mean, hearing some of this stuff come out right now, was, man, I was thinking, okay, I can probably buy a, a used Tesla for 20 grand that already has that full self-driving in it right now and wait for it, wait for it when it if it comes when it comes for the full autonomy and be ready just to deploy it as a taxi and that's all it does and it just generates if it does if it is 100k whatever and it's just like a i, I own an employee basically <laughs> an uber employee and it's doing it for me and i just bought that car specifically for that you know it's a it's an extra revenue stream 
I think that people right now, they are freaking out on these technologies, uh, robot technology and as well um, <laughs> AI and all of that. But uh, it creates a lot of different businesses. Mm -hmm. Like literally, <laughs> you're going to have to have shops like, a, like you have collision places, right? To be able to... Um, to kind of fix cars when they are like a, in a problem. I can mm -hmm. see shops that Tesla might not be able to fix all of the uh, robots and appliances and everything. So they're going to start hiring other companies. Mm -hmm. So you're going to start seeing maybe some uh, robot shops that they are fixing cars and uh, appliances, your, your Optimus, right? Yeah. <laughs> your Robo Butler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Robo. So speaking of the Robo Butler, right? I know we we actually just talked about this last week or the week before mm -hmm. that we were brainstorming one time where what's a good what's a good company to start and I was saying man if I just had like a a butler to grab my beer or grab my soda or make me dinner or to wash my dishes for me that would be awesome well Apple must have been listening because I think that's the direction they're headed you've been talking about this uh, this robo butler right and so the story is. Apple was working on this, uh, their own version of their EV, right? They wanted to make the Apple EV. Uh, well, they abandoned that. They probably saw how close like Elon was with his robo taxi or, you know, they got, they got wind of it. So they're like, no, we need to uh, move on from the EV and try to get to whatever the next step is, which a lot of people are, are working towards robots. So Apple's ro uh, robo butler is going to be their next big thing, apparently. And like we said earlier. It's gonna be Siri, right? We're gonna call this. We're gonna call it Siri. Siri, do my dishes. Siri, make me a sandwich, and we'll see if it happens. What do you think about that? Would Would you be okay with having a, a robot in your if, home? If, you, you know, I, and I think that, uh, oh man, even a hundred k for that shit, you know. <laughs> so I'd be it's willing like, to pay for something like that, right? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's like a. I mean it. If the tech is there, I can even hijack it to program it as whatever I need, right? So, um, <laughs> what do you think about doing, Mando? <laughs> <laughs> don't get don't get ideas. <laughs> I will not hug yours for that, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, it, it's it's just. I, I, I would be nice if it's in the low, maybe like 10,000, 20,000, because it's like two times, three times the, the, the cost of an appliance. Mm -hmm. But knowing Apple, they'll, they'll do, I mean, they start off remember high. their Vision Pro. If it's Apple, yeah. they're going to come back with like 50K, 100K. Type yeah, of probably device. 100K, I'm sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so, and people will buy it. People, I mean, I'm, I'm running a Mac. I have my, like, I, I really like uh, Mac products. In cell phones, not so much. I do have uh, an iPhone and an Android, but um, uh, my preference for a phone is an Android. But yes, mm -hmm. I, I do like uh, Apple products. It's just quality, <laughs> man. Yeah, and you know what? We have heard Elon say he thinks the price of a at-home robot type thing would be in the 20 to 30K range, basically the cost of a small car. Um, is what he would expect it to be. Of course, it may not start at those prices. You know, we're going to start off with uh, with the Siri prices at 100, 100K for the for your Robo Butler. Um, but I, I think it's something that I think would be really neat. However, I'm, you know, you and me both are both like real tech savvy. We're interested in kind of the latest and greatest. There's a report um, back in 2021 from the Brookings Institute that said 60, over 60% of people of adults said that they're uncomfortable with the idea of robots like being in their home or just in general. Um, and so I think there's going to be this, um, this time where people are going to have to get used to the thought of having this thing, um, always in their home. But, but guess what? We've got Alexa, we've got Google home. We've got these things already sitting in our homes and kind of listening all the time already. Maybe that's like the little seedling that they planted there, knowing that in the future, there's going to be robots in the home. It's, 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 uh, it's going to happen. <laughs> and we're going to see it in our lifetime. So, uh, yeah, I, I, people can, it's just, it's going to become a trend. You start seeing maybe celebrities having the robots and obviously people is they are trying to copy celebrities and it just becomes trendy and all of the yeah. TikToks and voila, right? So I think that it will be 
Agree. Maybe older generations might say, oh, I just want to clean my dishes in the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, all right, be my guest. <laughs> That's too funny. Don't yeah, don't be right. one of those, Ramirez. <laughs> yeah, no, I won't be. Here's also one thing. I think there's just this big opportunity because there's a lot of elderly, all right, mm -hmm. that uh, get moved into homes and things like that because they need they need help in in their homes, right? As people age and get older, so I think this is going to be a real helpful thing for those for that demographic for those folks that you know they're not quite there yet to be able to be put like in a home or something like that, because they, they really do need like nursing type help. Mm -hmm. But for that gap, you know, this is, this is probably something, you know, that's would be super useful for those folks, you know, that just need a little bit of help at home, whether it's like to help them get ready for the day or help preparing things or help reaching things. Um, I think it's, I think there's a big market there. So those, these robots are going to be pretty successful. I can see. Yeah. Um, some of the nuances, and we probably need to discuss in different episodes, the technology. I still don't like the the servos and the motors. Um, it's just too, you know, like no. a... It's, Sounds it's mechanical. Smooth, very mechanical, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's like in mind when you're moving, every time that you're moving... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've got this constant ringing in my ear. Is that not the same thing? <laughs> it's a different story, man. <laughs> and you're hearing voices too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, technology has to get better and better, or mechanically speaking. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, we've got a long way to go, but yeah, you're right. And that probably has something to do with the, the what that survey says by the Brookings Institute that, you know, there's 60% of people that are like, nah, I don't know about this, about this thing. So there's this chasm that has to be bridged where people feel comfortable and you don't hear this mechanical whirring noises thing in your home. And it's uh, maybe there's a different technology, but yeah. very true. That's something that to think about. All right. All right. What, coming, what is next? We're coming to the end of the episode here. We've got the last section here. We're going to talk about billionaires. So you guys are familiar with the Forbes uh, billionaires under 30. Uh, there's uh, this week they did come out with their new billionaire um, um, edition, and they've noted something very interesting. So it's for the first time since 2009, so it's been um, um, uh, 15 years, right, that all of the <laughs> all of the under 30 billionaires they're actually heirs. Like they just inherited their billions versus uh, actually making their own billions. What do you think about that? Oh man, it's it's a uh, it, it's funny because um, Forbes they have um, all of these people under thirty, thirty under thirty, and a lot of them have been like uh, frosters, right? Like uh, you have like Theranos, oh, fraud, yeah. <laughs> You you have Terranos, you have like the uh, SB, SBR, right? So, mm -hmm. so you have all of these, um, uh, even the guy from WeWork, the same, right? He was on the list. So it is hard, obviously, to get to, to a billionaire status. But now that the billionaires are, I guess, in, uh, passing and passing away and dying, they, they are passing that uh, wealth to their kids. And I think that um, if they didn't, spend the time with their kids, these kids are going to be like brats, right? Like they don't know what to do with the money and they they might just blow it away. So so it's going to be an interesting uh, new uh, generation, right? Um, let's call it, I don't think that it's even all money. Some of these people, it was literally just one generation before. Mm -hmm. It's not like they have been like wealthy for generations, right? So uh want to be interesting with all of these uh, new rich, I guess, people that they maybe were not educated properly to what to do with that cash. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And I, I think a lot of people are categorizing this as a big generational shift. Like, yes, it's that older generation that is now finally passing down this. So we don't see under 30, there aren't like these, there aren't any new like that are self-made billionaires. There are some that are still right over 30. Like we're talking about like the Snap co-founder, Evan uh, Spiegel, the Gymshark co-founder, uh, Ben Francis, and the Oculus guy, Palmer Lucky. Um, these guys are still uh, fairly young. They're like 33 and 31. Um, 
And yes, they are self-made billionaires. So we do see that, but it's just kind of interesting that there aren't any under 30. So it, it's, it's very interesting to hear about that. Um, maybe that's going to be the, the new thing is really these new billionaires are going to be uh, just inherited. Maybe there's, there's like this backlash that's incoming because of the SBF and FTX, right? The Theranos, um, there's a backlash where people are going to be um, as trusting um, with these younger folks that aren't going to allow them to really get to that billionaire status right away or so quickly. So maybe there's this shift that's that's going on uh, that where people are going to be a little bit more skeptical of these folks that are that are still pretty young. Um, and we're, we're not going to see that self-made billionaire under 30 anymore. Yeah, I mean, the one that it comes to my mind is uh, Mr. Beast. Um, it's he. I was just right now checking. He's twenty five years. Mm. Uh, so I think that he obviously has a a shot. His uh, the, the thing with him is that he sometimes regularizes all his money into better videos. So uh, yeah. But I think that that's one that comes to my mind that I can see him in. He in could probably five make years. it in five years. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, yeah. so that'd be a, that'd be a pretty good story. But maybe it's just it's gonna be fewer and fewer, right? Um, anyways, well, so that's all we've got for the billionaire watch this week. And I just want to remind y'all again, don't forget to like subscribe and comment again. We'd love to hear from you. We would like to bring you guys your comments up into our podcast so we can talk about them. Um, and again, a reminder, if you haven't watched our viral Bitcoin all time high meme remix, check it out on our channel. We'll link it there. Um, and we do have a new one coming up fairly soon. We're almost finishing the editing, so you can have another cool uh, Bitcoin remix to listen to um, on Miguel our Miguel Marinero. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel Marinero, right? Michael said that's a good one. Uh, well, that's all we've got for today. We'll see you all next time. Dale. Dale.